hardly any neuroscientist will be pretend that we know really what consciousness is for a very good reason is that it's a matter of experience and experience is experience as the first person you cannot know what experience is by describing everything from the outside you know what kind of neurons have been activated what kind of area of the brain even you knew the the function and the activity of billion of neuron when you are angry or see the color red or feel love that will tell you absolutely zero so what it feels to experience love or anger so Modern science now tells us that meditating or training your mind for a relatively short window of time can create pretty big changes in behavior and outcome. But what if you actually spend somewhere between 40 and 60,000 hours in meditation? Well, that's the life that today's guest, Mathieu Ricard, has lived. Growing up in France, the son of a renowned philosopher and an acclaimed painter, he start to stake his claim as a scientist in molecular genetics when he decided to actually make a pretty fierce left turn and found himself living in a hermitage in Nepal studying Buddhism. He eventually took his vows and became a monk and has lived there ever since full time, devoting himself to the study and the practice and the relieving of suffering. Along the way, he has started a foundation called Karuna Sechen, which now serves, uh, it helps educate and provide health care for some 300,000 people. And he has written a series of books, the latest of which is a really fascinating dialogue between him and a friend of his, Wolf Singer, who is a neuroscientist, around how classic Buddhist practices rewire your brain. It's called Beyond the Self. I had the opportunity to sit down with Matthew as he was here in New York for a brief amount of time before returning to Nepal. And we went deep into both his own personal journey, how he made decisions like leaving sort of popular mainstream life uh, as a rising scientist to become a monk in Nepal, to how all of these different practices profoundly changed him and his life, and how it is, has also inspired him to then return to a certain extent and participate in the evolution of science around these practices and also begin writing again and sharing and publishing books and also heading up this foundation, Karuna Sechen. So really excited to share this conversation with you. I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. I'm fascinated by by you, by your story, by your work. And what I'd love to do is sort of touch down in different parts of your okay. your story. Grew up in um, in France uh, in a family that seems like it was very steeped in scholarship in philosophy. And from what I know, your your dad was a philosopher. Your mom was at one point. She's a painter, and she's ninety four. And we just uh, last year helped to make a book of 70 years of her painting, which was a wow. beautiful photo book. And they did a big exhibition of 70 years of painting. Uh, how wonderful. So she's still alive and she doesn't paint anymore because her hands are getting too feeble. But she knew all the, you know, all the painters of her time. And simply she left for India for 20 years. So that made a fatal blow to her career. But she was already exposing in... In, in museums, and she did a, a scene, the sort of paintings for Maurice Béjar, who was a famous uh, choreographer. So she was, she would have a nice career, but she thought she became a Buddhist nun as well. So that's usually not very good for PR for a, <laughs> for a, for a Parisian painter <laughs> <laughs> to vanish for twenty years. Uh, what made her? What drew her to that? I mean, if, if she was very much on a path as a painter, what made her then become a well, Buddhist I mean, monk? I'm a, I was a scientist and a photographer, and yeah. I, was, I became a Buddhist monk. So I guess probably the same reason that I moved from a scientific career to uh, study with Tibetan master is that, uh, well, you find very interesting people in the artistic world, in the science world, in the f intellectual world. But it not necessarily gives you, uh, you know, role models for living a, a good life and also to become a better human being, to also be at the, more at the service of society and go at the root of the mechanism of happiness and suffering. So, you know, Parisian life is not particularly conducive to flourishing. <laughs> 
and you know, a lot of tormented people. And also, the thing that struck me, and I guess it struck her as well, is that you meet all kind of people who are genius in their own fields, but that doesn't translate necessarily as being a good human being. Mm. So it's puzzling for uh, you know, 18 years old to see those great mathematicians, scientists, philosophers, and some of them are wonderful people. Some of them are absolutely impossible, but if you, it does not seem to have nothing to do with their other skills for which they are sort of renowned. So there's this kind of discrepancy that is incoherence in a way that is puzzling. While after I met those men and women of wisdom in the Himalayas, you can't have a spiritual master that is very respected and sometimes say, he's a great master. What a pity he's so angry, jealous, arrogant. It doesn't work because they are respected as spiritual teacher because the messenger is the message and they are people of compassion, of wisdom, of inner strength, of humility. And so whatever you look as a human quality, you would like to become like them, not just to know the skills that they have developed. It's so interesting the way you phrase that. I'm asked often how I how I choose um, who to bring into these conversations. And one of the things that I've realized, maybe I didn't realize I was doing it in the beginning, but I realized since then is I look for what I would call embodied teachers, teachers who don't just have you know incredibly bright things to say, but when you look at the way they live your, their lives, when you're in their presence, you just feel there. there's this, to use your word, coherence. Yeah, I'm new, so one of so I spent seven years nonstop with the teacher. Another thirteen years with after my first teacher passed away with the second teacher, Tilgo Kensir Moshe. And that, you know, for many years I was his kind of attendant, means I was sleeping on the floor in his room, he was very old and uh, being there all the time in when he was meeting kings and when he was uh, giving teachings to farmers, you know, all kinds of situations. And in thirteen years I never ever witnessed an action or a word that could remotely harm anyone. It's not that he was, you know, like a passive, everything is okay, uh, let everyone run over me. He was incredibly strong and, you know, and this, you were in a feeling of awe in front of him. But, and sort of, no any crack or defect in the armor of unconditional loving kindness, but not this kind of softy, sentimental one. He could be strict, but also it, you knew it was just for getting rid of some of your defect. So the mixture of being like a mountain, unshakable mountain, and no, you could not find defects. So, and it's not sh also something showy or advert self-advertising. It's something that you discover with time. So even you cannot judge of the ultimate uh, enlightenment of someone from, in from the inside. But that coherence that you see over the years in private, in public, with humble people and with the you know, supposedly you know, big staff, it's, this is a teaching in itself. Mm. Because, you know, if you see of someone, oh, I've never seen him doing anything that could be remotely harmful to someone, you say, well, oh, of course, but, you know, it's, it's not very common in daily life. <laughs> someone would never hurt someone. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to... Um... I want to fill in a, a quick gap. <laughs> so we, we were talking about your mom and her decision to, uh, to take her path. You started down a very traditional path. You started down the traditional path of academics and science and you pursued your PhD. And it sounds like the, the reasons that your mom and you both changed course pretty dramatically were pretty similar because you then went from the world of science and academia to a monastery in Nepal. Well, uh, first of all, yes. So, again, you know, I traveled when I was a little bit over 20 yeah. in 1967, met a great master, including the one who's become my first main teachers. And then I came back and forth, you know, many times for, I think I went seven times back and forth until I finished my PhD uh -huh. every summer for a month. So even while you're pursuing... So I had really yeah. a, a lot of time to mature that, not to make sort of hasty decision and to let this be a natural uh, sort of culmination of aspiration. You know, it's like a, I like the example of a, an apple on the branch. If it's too early, you pull hard the green apple and you break the branch and you get a fruit that is not edible. 
When it's ready, you just put your hand and turn a little bit and it falls in your hand. So when things are ready, it's natural, effortless, it's the obvious things to do. So after seven years in, or six years at Pasteur Institute, it was the clear thing that this is where I wanted to live, the kind of person I wanted to be with, and what I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life. And I, retrospectively, you know, I'm you know, nearly 72, I feel incredibly fortunate that I took that decision at the right time because too early might have been a little bit premature would have created difficulties with my father you no know, sort of waste of all the education too late would have been a waste of time <laughs> so it was perfect yeah i guess you follow your intuition to a certain extent with that it became obvious you know those things people oh how can you, you know such a difference you know you live the parisian life a scientific career just go to the himalayas to a small hermitage without heating light, uh, electricity and running water must have been a shock or something it was the most natural obvious things to do you know you like cross a mountain pass discover another valley and you're happy to settle there it was absolutely a no just a small seamless transition Mm. Even from the outside, it looks like a big jump. Yeah, I, but I mean, it really goes along with what you were saying earlier, which is that you see people of arts and science in a big city with huge accomplishments in their field. And yet underneath that, so often, the more fundamental science and art of just living a good life is not being expressed. Well, you know, it's not that there are, of course, <laughs> scientists are bad people. Yeah. They're extraordinarily good people. I just come from... Madison, Wisconsin, where I've been collaborating with Richard Davidson, who is the leading neuroscientist, is a, such an incredibly good human being. What, what I was mostly saying is that there's no obvious correlations. Yeah. Is the, be a very good scientist doesn't mean that you'll be a very good human being. You can be terribly mean also, while you need that coherence for a spiritual master. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no point. Mm. <laughs> When you decided to actually stay full time for the first time, from what I know, and, and tell me the details, um, you didn't immediately take vows as a monk. That still took an, a yeah, number of I'll, time. Yeah, you know, monks may also seem something from the outside that's quite visible, you know, like a walking flag almost with this mm. colorful dress. And again, for me, it was a no brainer at some point. Uh, so I sort of settled there when I was 26. And then after. Uh, two years, my first, I spent well, seven years in Darjeeling without going anywhere. And after after three years, my first teacher passed away in 1975. So I stayed another four years in the Hermitage. I did over maybe five years of solitary retreats with some guidance from time to time. Then in the late 79, I went with my second teacher, Diego Kensel Moshe, receiving, he was giving four months of non-stop teaching to thousands of devotees, monks, and lamas. So, you know, until 30, I didn't know whether I would have a family life or not, but solution seems to be, you know, equally interesting in a way. So at that time, there was someone uh, who was very well known for giving monastic ordination, and I, I was more or less living in a very simple way. So I asked my teacher, you know, would it be good to just simplify my life by becoming a monk? He said, oh, great idea, it would be very good. So at 30, I took monastic vows, but again, it was also effortless, just like a little step over something. And I felt great freedom because, you know, I could not imagine, you know, if you have a family and children, of course, you have to have some responsibility. I mean, you cannot just say, okay, I'm, uh, hey guys, I'm going to the mountains for three years in retreat. And so I wish you were, <laughs> you can't do that. And so... It's a wonderful adventure to raise up children. It's a, it's a wonderful act of love and, and enriching experience. I, I, I'm sure I've seen that. You know, now we founded a, with to our humanitarian organization. Now we have 30,000 children in our school. So I all the time with kids and in our monastery, we have young kids also. So I, I see that. But at the same time, I wanted to one pointedly pursue the spiritual path. So it was much easier to just be completely free. If I want to get up, I get up. And the only thing I leave behind is the, my footsteps. Mm. I have no house, no low land, no car, no nothing. So I'm just completely free. 
Good Life Project is supported by Ring Floodlight Cam. Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer. Today, over a million people are using the Ring video doorbell to help protect their homes. And it doesn't stop there. They've actually extended that same security to the rest of your home with a super cool product called the Ring Floodlight Cam. Just like the amazing doorbell, the Floodlight Cam is a motion activated camera and floodlight that connects right to your phone with HD video and two way audio that lets you know the moment anyone one steps on your property. You can even see and speak to visitors. It'll set off an alarm right from your phone. And with the floodlight cam, when things go bump in the night, you immediately know what it is. Whether you're home or away, the Ring floodlight cam lets you keep an eye on your home from anywhere. And the floodlight cam also offers the ultimate in-home security with super high visibility floodlights and a powerful HD camera that puts security in your hands. Save up to $150 off a ring of security kit when you go to ring.com slash good life. Ring.com slash good life. That's ring.com slash good life. You mentioned, um, solitary retreats or um, time in solitude for what to a Western mind would seem like an inhuman amount of time. I think we, we, we tend to have trouble with being with our thoughts for a few hours and, and you're talking about being on retreat for years. Um, tell me more about what, what this experience is and also why it's important. Well, you see, if you build a hospital, uh, you might say, oh, no, it's not a good idea. You know, you are a surgeon. Why don't you operate in the street? Emergency and that's you know the time you will spend three years all the construction work the plan bridge to city that's a waste of time you know, it doesn't cure anybody zero but when it's ready it's so much a powerful tool to alleviate suffering so the idea is to really perfect yourself to become a little bit more of service to others because i can see now in the humanitarian world where i'm quite engaged we have 200 humanitarian projects in asia now what derails very often the such projects are usually a lot of ego conflict of egos um, people mm, burning out or worse corruption hmm. so those are human shortcomings so instead of you know doing a training for NGOs by how to do proper audited accounts, etc., which is, of course, necessary to be transparent. But one of the main ones would be to grow your fortitude, your resilience, your determination to be at the service of others and not just see how people treat you, what they say, what they do, not trying to, everybody should be perfect on the way, you're about to build a school somewhere, but your job is not to make everybody perfect, your job is to build the school, make everybody perfect, that's the job of the Buddha. So, in a way, to have this um, inner sort of, to cultivate these fundamental human qualities is definitely not selfish. It's actually preparing you better to be of service uh, to others. Mm -hmm. And then the, the extensive time in solitude is sort of a, a, a mechanism to allow that to happen on well, a it's not, level? Uh, the solitude is definitely not to get away from people. It's, the, it's like, Say, you could see a, a musician, an athlete, who is early in the, in the morning, alone in the, in the training, in the stadium where there's no spectators, and he, again and again he runs or swims, or three hours of swimming in a swimming pool. This is sort of not very glamorous, you could say, but that was allow them to then, you know, be a, a, at the top of their qualities. So if we are like, a little bit like a wounded deer, that's high in the forest until the, the wounds are healed, then it can gamble and, and frolic around with other deer. So our wounds are not just the wounds of suffering, depression. It's really in case of you know, basically healthy, healthy mind, healthy body person, there's still the wounds of ignorance, uh, of you know, animosity, jealousy, arrogance, craving, those are you know, afflictive mental state that we all have to different degrees. And those are source of torment for oneself, torments for others. So in a way, we need to give us the time to go to the root of that, to uproot them. Uh, you know, especially the Buddhist past offer the whole array of methods to do that. And they're very rich, they're very complex. So you need to go to this systematic training of the mind to free the mind from those toxic elements. 
So that takes time because it took time for those to form in, in your mind, thought after thought, emotion after emotion. So it's not just like a magic bullet that in within three weeks of a self-help book or something, you will get rid of animosity and craving. That's, this is just like nonsense. So it takes time to make real progress. And that's why you know, we do that. Like it takes time to, it takes 10,000 hours for a pianist to play mm. you know, well and be uh, at his first concert. So. You know, some of my friends, when we evaluated roughly uh, the numbers of hours of practice when we went to the lab, we, you know, we don't usually count that, of course, <laughs> it would be stupid. But for the neuroscientists, they needed to know roughly what we went through. So many of us had done 40 to 6,000 hours of practice or meditation. Yeah. So that makes a difference. <laughs> it's huge. So, so it's so fascinating. So it's really less about... It's less about solitude. It's less about withdrawing yourself from other people. It's more about creating the conditions yes. to allow yourself to just focus intensely exactly. on the practice. And also, on, yeah. it is uh, freeing oneself from the, the, the scattering, right. distracting, endless you know, noise uh, of so many aspects of daily life. You know, right. this, this crazy speed and and those solicitation of the mind. You know, like. In, I was with a Tibetan Lama one time in Times Square seeing all those, you know, lights. Yeah, yeah. He said, you know, they are trying to <laughs> steal my mind. <laughs> so that well, have, your mind right, is completely actually. stolen by the ads, the radio, the news, the, the, the social, you know, encounters where everybody squats, blah, blah, blah. And then the mind is even 10 times more, blah, 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 of the neurons. So that's not a conducive uh, sort of conditions to mature something over time in, in a deeper way. So the solitude, the conditions of, well, not always completely alone, there might be other retreatants, but the suitable condition that you can pursue, uh, especially at the beginning, this, uh, this process of transformation will be constantly taken away from it. Yeah, and it's, it's really the conditions to pursue this sort of, what I guess in, in almost modern terms would be considered the deliberate practice to allow yourself to not perfect, but I guess cultivate the stillness, the the awareness. Well, yes, my people know that you know yeah. musicians they spend hours and hours right. every day. So nobody finds yeah. that strange. Actually, they are they are admiring the kind of self discipline and dedication. So this is about doing the same thing with the mind. So mm. it will be a mystery if uh, all those qualities will be at the top right at the beginning without any training. That will be an exception for sure. Yeah, and it's so interesting that you made that comparison because when you think about athletics or arts or performance or science, well, of course, people assume naturally you would focus on this one particular field and you put in your time, you do the work to become mm -hmm. you know, as good as you can be at it. But when we're talking about just perfecting the mind in the name of living a better life or relieving suffering, yes, we don't have that same lens. Well, that's a, what we call contemplative mind science or contemplative science. Uh. And, and also it's not with the idea of becoming an extraordinary performer, you know, like a champion. Mm. Uh, so the idea of performing better than others is not the point. It's the idea that it takes time to cultivate those qualities. And now the reason why I did this dialogue with a great neuroscientist, Wolf Singer, over eight years of meeting from time to time is precisely that over the last 20 years, you know, the neuroscience has found out that the, the before that the brain can change until you're dead. Before it was thought that once you reach adulthood, the brain is so complex that if you were changing something, it would mess up the whole thing. And then it was found with various ways that in animals first and then in humans, that anytime you become exposed to a new situation or you train in something new, whether it's singing, juggling, or, or in that case, meditating, or even learning as uh, London cab drivers would learn 14,000 streets by heart, their brain change. So then the same thing happens with uh, training in compassion, training in focused attention. So that's why it was a natural encounter for uh, you know, contem Buddhist contemplative to work with neuroscientists. And there's a new field, we could say, that's called contemplative neuroscience. Mm. And last year in San Diego, there was a symposium that was the third one of anyone interested in those fields clinical application of meditation, neuroscientists looking at the change in the brain. There was a thousand scientists, not just like, you know, uh, self-help people, but really serious scientists coming for 
you know, see what is the progress in the field. And it's, uh, there's more and more research being done to, in that sector. Yeah, it, it really is interesting to see those two worlds t coming together. And it feels like it's just the last 10, 15 years that really it's caught on. There's a tremendous amount of research and publication. Yes, um, absolutely. The number of publications on mindfulness has gone from 20 per year, 20 years ago, to I think it's, that was 400 last year. Yeah. And also you found some... We found some, when I discussed with Wolf Singer in this book called Beyond the Self, we call it like that because one of the findings that we found so similar between the Buddhist approach and neuroscience is that there's no central post of command in the brain. So the brain is all about synchronicity between different areas, dynamic rearranging of those different areas talking to each other, and the result is a particular mental state. So it's like emergent phenomena all the time, completely dynamic, with everyone talk, every area talking to each other, mm. and there's no, you know, like a hub in the middle, like a, like the control tower in an airport. So that is very close to the idea of the the lack of inherent existence of the self in Buddhist philosophy, where we say, of course, there is a self, but it's a conventional labor that we give to the dynamic flow of experience that our consciousness goes through that makes our person, our personal history, but there's no autonomous, separate, uh, permanent entity that is the self. That is often the case when you think of the soul in Christianity or the Atman in Indian, there's a kind of entity. Buddhism said there's no, it's just a dynamic stream and to that we give a label of a name or an individual. But so in a way, over the years, by collaborating with neuroscientists, I found that it's a very easy and natural collaboration because we don't have stumbling blocks where science and Buddhist um, sort of Buddhist approach of the mind are irreconcilable. The only big contentious issue is the nature of consciousness. Is mm. it hundred percent the brain or not? But there's no such thing as saying, you know, okay. According to our scripture, the world was created in six days, and that's it. So now, of course, science is just just can't go on like that, it doesn't work. So then you're stuck. But in with the Buddhist exchange, we are not stuck, you're just continually exploring in a empirical way. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it feels to me like a, a lot of that really easy relationship also comes from the fact that Buddhism is not sort of, I'm coming from the place of a neophyte, but my experience of Buddhism is that it, it is not sort of a hierarchical, theological, traditional religion, the way that you look at so many others where there is some entity or some being and there are supernatural claims, which, which you either buy into from a place of faith or not, you know, without judgment yes. either way. Whereas Buddhism has always struck me as more of a science of living that, that within its own teachings opens itself up to testing and validation. Well, Dalai Lama said if any tenets of Buddhism is clearly... Uh, refuted by science, then we have we have no problem of abandoning it, mm. no issue at all. But there are things which still, uh, you know, is far from the view of most uh, modern scientists, especially about the nature of consciousness, where Buddhism says, you know, the the matter it cannot come ex nihilo. The idea of creating something from nothing and becoming something, there's a lot of logical arguments against that. It cannot also disappear into nothingness. So that's a primary phenomena. But he said the same is true for consciousness. Because we see a present instant of my consciousness, immediately preceding instant has to be of the same nature. You know, you can't have an unconscious moment. The next immediate moment is conscious. So there's to be a chain of conscious moment continuing because the cause has to be, the result has to be somehow coherent in nature with its cause. So that means also there is a beginningless stream of consciousness and you so cannot come to complete end. I mean, it cannot disappear into nothingness. So that aspect is uh, quite f far from what most neuroscientists believe, the reductionist approach, or the physicalist approach of consciousness being just a property of matter, of the complexity of the neurons and so forth. But still, you know, no, hardly any neuroscientist will be pretend that we know really what consciousness is for a very good reason is that it's a matter of experience and experience is experience as the first person you cannot 
know what experience is by describing everything from the outside, you know, what kind of neurons have been activated, what kind of area of the brain. Even you knew the, the function and the activity of billions of neurons when you are angry or see the color red or feel love. That will tell you absolutely zero so what it feels to experience love or anger. So this pure experience, you cannot get out of it to study it. So that is what is called in the science, uh, the, the science of consciousness, the heart problem. So more, even Western philosophers call it the heart problem. And you can get out of that. So in a way, the, certainly there are different perspectives about that. Uh, and the, the, in that sense, Buddhism and most of the neuroscientists would not agree. But still, it's a matter of investigation. It's not a dogma. Yeah. Building on that, though, I think, and, and this is where this is where I struggle with some of the ideas as well. I feel like it builds on on this point that you're making is the idea of reincarnation, of consciousness sort of moving from yes. one manifested state into the next and the next and the next. So that is vastly usually uh, not very well understood for cultural reason. Okay. No, in the West, it's basically, it's not at all in the culture. In the East, whether you a sophisticated philosopher or not, people, it's part of their, what, what their worldview. Now, they said it very exotic of thinking, you know, a young child remembering past lives and all that, although there are hundreds of such testimony, but now how can you test that scientifically? That's another point. But that's why the real issue is the nature of consciousness. Right. So first of all, to dispel misunderstanding, uh, Buddhism, so-called reincarnation, is not about an individual entity jumping from one body to another one through some passing to some mysterious stuff. Because there's no such thing as a self, self-autonomous self. So it's more like, as I mentioned briefly earlier, the fact that the stream of consciousness cannot be born ex nihilo and cannot entirely disappear as well. Because that moment of consciousness now will trigger the next one. So that process goes on. So that's the view. So again, it's not about a, an individual entity sort of jumping from one life to another. It's the continuation of a flow of consciousness mm -hmm. just as you know, the world of material phenomena is ceaselessly transforming, but even something like an object is broken or is burned, but that doesn't mean that the particles, the atom goes into nothingness. It transforms into something else. When your body dies, it goes and it's eaten by worms and it's whatever. The, we're all sort of stardust in a way. And so that doesn't go into nothingness either. So that's the view of Buddhism. So the point of the continuation of consciousness beyond this association with the physical body is really comes down to what is the nature of consciousness. And so far, that question, uh, even from scientific perspective, as far from being settled. Mm. <laughs> so the, the, the discussion with uh, Buddhist contemplative and philosopher is still very much alive. Yeah. I want to talk about meditation with you because it, it really does seem to be at the center of the practices that allow for the cultivation of all these states of being towards the end of relieving suffering and living well in the world. You, in your teaching and in your writings, um, describe a couple of different uh, styles, approaches, types of meditation. From what I've seen, um, at least three, compassion meditation, I believe what you call um, open presence. Open presence, yes. Right. What's the language around the third one? Is So it? you see, uh, actually, people speak of meditation is like, it's a, such a generic term. Yeah. It's like training. So, right. so tell me what you, you mean tell to one it. of your friends, okay, I, de I decided to train. He's waiting for, the, for what comes next. Uh, are you training in chess or swimming? So it's the same. If you train the mind, what are you training the mind to? To become a merciless uh, uh, sniper that will uh, harden his mind so that he will kill anybody that he's supposed to do? That's a form of training. You are hardening your mind and chasing away all forms of compassion. So the, your brain will change. Now, instead you decide to train focus attention. So the areas of the brain linked with focus attention will be changed and your way of being will be changed, will be more attentive, more present, uh, less distracted, more lucid, 
uh, less uh, carried away by ruminations and expectations and hope and fear. So that's one thing. Now, we all have a potential for loving kindness and compassion. We know that. We can, we can be unconditionally kind with a child, with a dear person, whoever, an animal. But it comes and goes. It's like fledging. It's not certainly at its optimal point. Like uh, any skill is not at its optimal point at the start. So this we can train. So that's another kind of meditation. Now, very often we have a very sort of narrow mind and everything that happened in that small space, you know, it's like a firecracker in a, in a little box. It creates a lot of damage. A firecracker in open space is almost unnoticeable. So likewise, open presence is a state which is extremely lucid, extremely clear, yet so vast. You know that the little thoughts of hopes and fears, they will be much more not able to destabilize you, not able to carry you away uh, into you know, of all kinds of reaction that will end up in torment. So it's kind of space of inner freedom. And that's key for emotional balance, for having the resources to lead the ups and downs of life, and for inner freedom, to rest in a peaceful state of mind where you not the slave of your own thoughts. So all those are different type of training that belong to the vast realm of meditation. So there's no such thing as meditation as one thing. Yeah, so it's really your, it's, it's different approaches for training. It's different aspects of training yeah. and certainly not emptying your mind and relaxing and getting as stupid right. as the, you can. The, the way that we're often told is just clear your mind of all thoughts, which but it doesn't work nearly anyway, impossible. So <laughs> who has ever cleared, cleared all his mind from work? It doesn't last more than five seconds. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting though is, is, so you just shared these th three, three different methodologies or, you know, and attached to each of them, you also shared a certain outcome that we, I think from the outside looking in, we would say is desirable or, or maybe not. How does the training relate to you attaching to wanting that outcome? Like, are, are you training for the purpose of that outcome or are you just training? Well, one of the outcome is to be free from attachment. So again, okay, you so, see, <laughs> right. the argument that meditation is selfish because you could be helping others. If the goal is to get rid of selfishness, it's not selfish. If the goal is to get rid of stickiness, of craving, of clinging, of grasping, it's not another yet another form of attachment. And we warn people, if you attach to the result and the goal, then you are sort of, the medicine becomes a poison. So because the goal is freedom from attachment. And if you are free from attraction, repulsion, hopes and fears, then animosity, hatred will not grow, compulsive craving will not grow, you have no reason to be arrogant, you have no reason to be jealous. So if you get rid of all these kind of graspings, that freedom actually is a goal that you, have, you cannot be attached to because it's the essence of, of freedom. So it's like saying in the middle of the sun, can you find a, a, an area of darkness? So it's really dissolving the very notion of craving at the root. So that freedom is desirable because no, who wants to suffer? Nobody wants to suffer and suffering comes from those things, from hatred, from craving and so forth. So to aspire to this freedom is not a form of attachment. It's like the person who is suffering for so long and is just fed up with that. This kind of weariness and lassitude. I want to get out of this vicious circle. So that aspiration is legitimate. It's not like grasping to a kind of blissful state or something, mm. like a little para artificial paradise. Yeah. You've referenced a number of times now that you have, for a, for a long time now, had scientific collaborations, sort of exploring working with neuroscientists, really looking at what's actually happening within the brain through this devotion to practice, to training over a long window of time, and also looking at the difference between the brains of people who've been doing this, I think you said 40, 60,000 hours, somewhere in there mm -hmm. for you, and versus somebody who's fairly new to this. When you talk about you know, aspiring to freedom, what is the neuroscience showing us changes within the brain of somebody who has engaged in these practices for extensively for a very long time sure. versus somebody who hasn't? Well, the point of doing so was some kind of natural curiosity for knowledge. 
you know, as an ex-scientist when uh, during a meeting of the Manian Life Institute in 2000 on destructive emotion where there was many of those great neuroscientists present in India at the residence of the Dalai Lama and I was participating and when the Dalai Lama asked us if you know, what can we contribute to society through these uh, encounters? And the idea of doing a research program came up. And then since I was an ex-scientist, I thought, okay, I will come and we'll see. So the idea and that collaboration has you know, become more and more fruitful was not just to prove that meditation changed you. you know, after all, we know that. We don't, and personally, you know, we have no need for outer proof because if you become a better human being and somehow you know it's because of the training you have undergone. You know, if the lab tells you that your brain has changed, then so what? But if you want to introduce it in secular ways, in schools, in all kinds of walks of life, I think nowadays, since most people put their trust in science, except a few crazy people, it happens sometimes, unfortunately, <laughs> to these days. But since science is a kind of source of valid knowledge, so if, if science, you know, yes, confirms that there's a real change. You're not just fooling yourself, you know, by being relaxed and feeling good. But then the, the next moment you are confronted with difficult situation, you again, just as before, you know, as unequipped to, to deal with those human situations. So what was found, yes, is that, uh, you know, each type of meditation has a different signature in the brain. And those changes are very significant uh, when meditators engage in specific meditation, say like compassion, there's area of the brain related to that, like parental love, empathy, positive effect, they are activated much more than they would be in untrained subjects. And then after time, you also see structural changes. Those area, uh, the gray matter is increased in volume, the number of connections is, is greater. So simply like uh, muscling your, you know, your arms or your, they simply, those areas grew stronger and they're more salient in the brain. So that became quite clear. And also when you ask the meditator to perform certain behavior tasks, like, you know, attention tasks, there was a task very simple that's called sustained attention task, vigilance task. So you see numbers on the screen, like uh, from zero to 10 and it's a small number, the flash is three or four per second. And then each time there's a zero, you push a button. That seems very simple. But what happens is your attention gets tired. After 10 minutes, people performance decreases sharply. But with trained meditators, they do that for 45 minutes with zero mistake out of 1,000 trials. So, and they don't seem to think it's a problem. So they have a tool that has been perfectly, you know, become more flexible, that is well-trained. And so maybe attention is a great thing, but it's, it's all the more interesting if it's about emotional balance, it's about loving kindness to be a good person and kind, benevolent, etc. So now it's quite clear. And that's we reviewed in the, in the Beyond the Self with the book with Rolf Singer. We have a big chapter on meditation on the brain to sort of make a quick review of, uh, of, the, of the science. And recently, again, there was a, we did, with Richard Davidson and Antoine Luis, we did an article in Scientific American about the effect of long term effect of meditation. So now it's widely accepted in the world of science. Yeah, I mean, what's fascinating to me also about the, the conversation in your latest book was the idea of efficiency, was the idea that you know, when you start, and it makes perfect sense because when you think about, you know, again, using the analogy of athletics or art or something like that, when you start something, it's very labor intensive and, and it's very inefficient in your brain and you're using a yes. lot of energy because you're not wired for that in That's the beginning. Right. But over time, through repetition, 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 your brain becomes, it sort of, it, it, it redirects all its wiring. It reconnects the yes. neurons in a different way and it becomes super efficient at this thing. So if you're talking about something like compassion, you know, in the beginning, it's a labor to effectively, because if this is not, not your natural state, you've got to yes. rewire things. But what I found fascinating was that over time, it seems like it just becomes, you know, from a behavioral standpoint, it just becomes much more the way that you are in the world. But it looks like there's neuroscience now support why that happened. Yes. It becomes, first it becomes contrived, difficult, and you don't do it well. And then in the middle, it still requires some effort and you do it okay. In the end, you do it perfectly without effort. It was very interesting that uh, in the attention task, 
they measured the beginners and untrained subjects. Those who have done, you know, reasonable amount of training, medium, say, like say 5,000 hours of practice on attention, and then the long-term meditators, you know, more than 30,000 hours. What they found is in the beginning, the attention areas are highly recruited. If you give them an attention task, they really try hard. The brain area are strongly activated, but they still don't perform very well. You know, it's like you learn how to ride a bicycle. <laughs> you are very nervous, a lot of attention, and still you, don't, you are very clumsy. Then the mid-term meditators, they still have to engage those areas very f- strongly, very actively, and they perform reasonably well. Now, if you go to the long-term meditators, they are absolutely good at the attention task, but they only need to slightly activate the attention area because they are sort of... Uh, you know, they are so well tuned. And I remember, it's like entering the floor. I remember a downhill Olympic skier, a woman who became gold, gold medal. And she says, you know, when I, when I won that downhill race, I felt like a river. Mm. It was totally effortless and beautiful. So that's the consummate skill. And so all those qualities, including well-being, which is a cluster of quality like loving kindness, inner freedom, those are skills that you can train. And that's, the, I think, one of the main features that came out of the collaboration between neuroscience and meditators. Yeah, and I love seeing that. It's really illuminating. I had this really interesting reaction to it. I'm curious what, what your response is to it, which is it's just such a clear manifestation of a Western mind where I said, wow, this is fascinating that you can actually see that happen in the brain. And then I looked at the numbers that they were using. It's like, like you said, that the difference between somebody who's considered kind of a newbie at around 5,000 hours of meditation versus somebody with, you know, like 30, 40, 50,000 hours of meditation. And the Western mind in me is like, wow, so somebody who's considered, you know, a novice has already got 5,000 yes, hours but, in. But the interesting, I think, for society, because, you know, who's going to do 5,000 hours right. and even less 50,000 hours? So if it wasn't the case that the second wave of research was about people doing 20 minutes a day, as we do for physical exercise, over a certain pe- a number of months. So if that has given hardly any result or difference, then you say, okay, then that's good for you in your hermitage in the Himalayas, but you know, that's uh, something out of mainstream. So it, it doesn't concern us. It cannot bring good to society. There's no point trying to put meditation in school because, you know, this is out of reach. Now, since it turned out that even four weeks of 20 minutes a day of caring mindfulness or a kindness curriculum like Wishy Davidson is doing in Madison and his Center for Healthy Minds, if that already gives a behavioral difference, kids become more pro-social, less discrimination, more emotional control or balance, if that happens within four or 10 weeks, and you can see in the brain that the neuroplasticity is already beginning to take place, then you say you are into something for society. And that's the case. And most of the clinical intervention now of mindfulness-based trash production, the MBSR that was started 30 years ago by John kabat it's obviously done with patients that goes through these eight weeks training right. and that gives tremendous uh, you know, good, uh, precious results. But that's different. You, you have there sometimes university professor or truck drivers or anybody. There's absolutely not people who have been uh, inclined to meditate before. And that's what is interesting is they continue after the training, most of them, because it brings them such benefits. So that is the main point, in fact, for society out- outcome of our collaboration. Yeah, so it's, it's more the actual, it seems like, interestingly enough, the, the behavioral outcome manifest far more quickly than the sort of neurological efficiency in the brain. But you can see the, the change happening in the level of the, of the brain, of course, yeah. but it's not as big. And also, you see all, all kinds of change in the, in the immune system and in all other aspects of our health as well. Right. So the real goal ultimately is to you know, get rid of the cause of suffering, but in the meantime, you get also some bonuses on the way. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because there is... You talk about this in the recent conversation. Um, there's always, once you see something where there's a benefit, then one of the questions always is, can I, quote, hack this in some way? Can I use neurofeedback, biofeedback, uh, 
you know, substances um, to try and get these similar benefits without having to actually what do the that? slow, painstaking work. And we're seeing that a lot, so I'm curious. Like that's uh, like kids who want everything right now and make a tantrum. <laughs> it was not it. just kids, you know, but more like the grown-up versions of those kids. But you see, okay, athletes, they say Olympic athletes, unfortunately, there's been a lot of cases of doping, right? Yeah. So because they're all at the top and they want to get this slight edge on their competitors. But imagine nobody would have thought, okay, you know, I'm not going to train at all. I'm just going to train a substance and I'm going to beat a and bolt. It will never work. So they do that as enhancers. But you can, you know, you can, you don't need substances. You can put, you know, some, sometimes for people who suffer from epilepsy, you have to find out the, some place in the brain where you can put some electrodes so to neutralize the fits. Now, while doing that, you have to look. So you open the, the skull and you put some electrodes and try to find the area that will prevent an epileptic fit. Mm -hmm. While doing so, the scientists found that sometimes they put the electrode in a particular area and people feel incredible bliss like they never felt in their life. Like unbelievable bliss. Take out the electrode, boom, it's gone. You put it a little bit next, within seconds, they feel there's no need for me to be in this world. It's obvious to them. They want to, like they will commit suicide in one minute. Take off, come back. So you, know, you could do that. You could put substances in the brain, but just there, there are like ex, uh, so stimulations of the brain, but there's no neuroplasticity. The moment you take off the, the trigger, the drug, the electrode, the, it, it's gone. So it doesn't replace training at all because training brings about a complete restructuration of several areas of the brain. Not only one area that is sort of muscled up, but the way the connectivity with others area is changed. So basically you are changing the brain in an incredibly complex way that never any s a specific substance or stimulation or feedback will ever do. And also the idea that, you know, you would put a few electrodes on the forehead and when you engage in meditation, it goes beep, 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 or you hear birds singing, and through that you can know that you are in the right thing and you could do further. I mean, it's like, like children's game. Compassion has to be recognized, or loving kindness, you have to identify that feeling. You have to live with it for hours and hours and hours, and then gradually it will soak in your innermost being and it becomes not a second nature, but your nature. So that's, you don't need those beep, beep, beeps to do that. You need sound instruction from a qualified teacher and a lot of practice. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting because there's, I'm curious about all of this. I'm curious about any technology or training technology. But I guess it's that, tempting for people to bring up well, with gimmicks I th and I stuff. Think, I think it is because we want we want to get there now. We want um, a quick fix. But there's really interesting research around, so I'm not somebody who dabbles in any sorts of substances, there has been some really interesting research that's come out over the last few years around experimentation with certain psychedelics and end-stage cancer patients, how they're like mired in feelings of anxiety and fear and in a single experience with a substance like psilocybin during the moment of the experience has them reconnect with spaciousness and expansiveness. And and what what's interesting to me is in at least the research I've seen is that even once they're out of the immediate effect of it, you know, the few hours, the diminishment of anxiety and the feeling of spaciousness and being yes. completely peace seems to sustain. So that that's where my I guess if you is. had the insight that the mind can be in a very different state, yeah, uh, not through training but to either a psychedelic drug or sometimes with through near death experience. Uh, you know, near death experience is when you get some accident or some right. terrible scene. You're almost about to die, but you come back, but you had some incredible experience when it was at the borderline between dying and not dying. And many of those experiences are mind opening. So to see this vastness, this possibility, even though you don't experience it, is as having been somewhere with a beautiful landscape and that you know there's something there. So that comforts you on the idea that, well, there's, there's other things. It's not completely limited to our little sort of narrow state of mind. And that might 
give you some kind of encouragement to slowly build something in that direction. This probably won't be exactly the same and probably is the good thing. Uh, but that the, we usually underestimate the power of transformation of mind mm -hmm. because we see that within minutes, if we have this substance, the mind behaves so differently and experiences the world so differently. So we say, okay, if those, that's a transitor, transitory state. But now if you tell me that through sustained training, I definitely can enhance vastly my compassion. I can become free from, you know, animosity, this vicious anger, jealousy, a state of inner freedom that comes with some kind of deep sense of fulfillment. No, I tend more to believe that possibility because I've seen briefly a glimpse of that. Mm. You know, it's like a, a teaser of a beautiful yeah, movie. It's like the trailer. <laughs> right. Trailer. <laughs> That's, I like that visual, actually. <laughs> Um, one of the things that you also speak about, and, and this is something that's just kind of fascinating to me as well, is as training the mind, various approaches to training the mind become more and more popular and people are exploring them, there's science around it and popular practice, there can be side effects. There can be unintended effects of this training and practice. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'd call them side effects, but it, it doesn't just make everything better for everybody. Is and that would, so? Apparently, I'm told. <laughs> Well, I think I would call them more unexpected bonuses, usually. Yeah. Side effects, you know, it depends what you, it depends what you do. If you put someone who is extremely disturbed, sometimes people call it neurotic or whatever, but let's say someone who has a lot of difficulties, a lot of inner suffering and conflict, who is at the edge of depression, you know, whose mind is really in a difficult state, very confused, a lot of uh, conf conflicting things and so much cause of inner torments and suffering. Now, all of a sudden, if you put that person, okay, you now you do a 10 day, completely silent, 10 hours a day, intensive practice, their mind might go completely wild and sometimes they may fall into good, you know, these things could escalate in the wrong way. But that's simply because it's not the way, to, a, a, a very, it's not a very healthy way to proceed. Now, if someone is disturbed, then first of all, in, especially in Buddhism, there's so many teachings that usually in traditional way come much before doing meditation. You know, seeing what are the, the different things that bring about suffering, craving, like rumination. So first analyzing the very causes of suffering, realizing that human existence is so precious, you are giving this opportunity, you know, for whatever lifetime you have, to go from this state of confusion and suffering to a more sort of state of freedom and goodness. So you have a fantastic opportunity given, like giving a field to a peasant. You also have to reflect on impermanence. That is, you will die, but you don't know when. So suddenly you start to set in more, uh, in, you put the, the, the foundation with a worldview and then, okay, what are the causes of suffering? It's animosity, rumination, hope and fear. First, looking from the outside with the help of someone to identify those. And how could I use some antidote? You're given all kinds of tools. You are not just dumped into a meditation room and say, you know, sit there and do nothing, don't move and deal with your mind. And that mind is such a chaos. It is sort of destroy yourself. So I think it's basically, you know, just sort of inappropriate situations that normally would never happen if you do it in traditional way with a authentic or qualified uh, instructor. Yeah, so I, I guess that's really, that is, that's the big point is that it's important to do this in the right context under the right instruction where it's not just the training, but also its guidance and its teachings around that, and it's the, the tools that also support it. Well, once in my life, I've been in a Maserati. <laughs> this guy in Paris <laughs> took me, and he said, you know, if I put the accelerator to the ground, the car is going to spin on itself because it's so powerful. Yeah. So I said, well, it's not something to put in the hands of a Buddhist monk. <laughs> <laughs> so likewise, you know, there are methods to first clean your ha mental house and yeah, everything right. has to be gradual and progressive. So you don't put someone who has never piloted an airplane uh, on a supersonic jet. Hmm. You first put it on a flight simulator. <laughs> 
where it is no risk of crashing and slowly, slowly you learn. Nah. Or you don't learn to sail on a boat on a super hurricane day. You learn with a fresh breeze on a beautiful day with a qualified sailor and slowly, slowly you gain skills. Mm. <laughs> makes perfect sense when you phrase it that and kind of lay out the picture that way. It occurs to me as we're speaking that uh, the, quote, career that started with you in science has never really ended. Well, it did. There was a big gap because for, uh, say, 30 years, yeah. I was completely on my own with my teachers, in the, I mean, my own, uh, not coming back to the Western world with my teachers in the Himalayas, practicing this small hermitage, studying the scriptures, hardly reading any Western book in either French or English. So I have a big gap of them, what happens in the world in those days. And it was kind of an accident when uh, in 1997, uh, someone proposed that I do a dialogue with my late father, the French philosopher Jean-François Revel, the monk and the philosopher, and became a huge sort of bestseller in France. So suddenly it was, you know, thrown back into the Western scenes and then it sort of snowballed because I did other books with astrophysicists and so, 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 so. But, uh, of course, I, I never imagined that I would go back to a scientific lab. So it's only in 2000 when I was uh, invited to participate in the Mind and Life Institute and later I became, I've, I've been close uh, associate with the Mind and Life Institute since then. I'm part of the family. We founded the Mind and Life Europe now. And so then, yes, I went uh, to the lab first as a guinea pig, then as a sort of collaborator, because the meditator has to co-design the, the protocol of the study with the scientists. Otherwise, how do you study meditation? So they made me co-sign some papers to show that it's not just subject and guinea pigs, but also full-fledged collaborators. So yes, I was certainly not expecting that. But again, you know, I don't do it that much. I go maybe a few days here and there, several times of the year, mm. to do the nice thing, which is to go in the scanner, try experiment, different states of mind, and then my scientific friend have to crunch the data for several months. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I go back to my mountains. I want to start to come full circle with you. I know we're... So, final question, really. Well, two more questions, because one is just a curiosity for me. Monastic life. Mm -hmm. When you go back and forth between, you know, when you're, you spend the vast majority of your time there and then you enter back into, you know, you come, you go to Wisconsin, you're in a laboratory mm -hmm. environment, you're in major cities. How is that for you? Well, the only reason I do that is, uh, you know, to share ideas that are dear to me. Uh, I believe that the collaboration is useful to society, you know, not the programs in school. So it's the idea of benefiting others in, certain, in different ways. Then, uh, you know, the books in the beginning uh, brought some resources and I don't, I don't need them. So I started this human, humanitarian organization, Karuna Sechen, thanks to not only the books, of course, but uh, after that, this expanding and a lot of philanthropists and, you know, uh, sp joining us. Now we are helping nearly 300,000 people every year in the field of health, education, and social services in northern India, Nepal, and Tibet. So that's also a reason why I sort of continue to move back and forth. And also there's uh, an opportunity when my friend Wolf Singer asked ask us to do this, uh, propose that we do this dialogue together over eight years that's just published by MIT Press. So you know, it's tempting with such a great mind to spend time on and off, you know, a week every year over a long time, and then we mature this dialogue. So it's of course it is inspiring and uh, this, this mutually enriching. But if I was thinking that this doesn't as much use, then I will happily stay in my hermitage uh, nonstop, and that actually I'm contemplating doing that much more because, you know, no, I've been doing that for twenty years, and I think. I could share whatever I could, and at some point, there's no point go, uh, going into the civilization of repetition. Mm. So I think I've done what I could. The humanitarian projects of Karuna Session who seems to will continue on their own merit, and I think probably I've talked too much. So <laughs> time to go back. As my dear 94 years, 94 years old mother says, silence is the language of the future. So I'm trying to put that into practice. Mm. How often do you, are you in touch with your mom? Well, well, because she's 94, I go much more often to see her. So I know yeah. I spend a few, several months every year oh, nice. um, because it's nice to be together. Yeah, yeah. And she lives uh, with 
uh, in the Buddhist center in south of France, where all my friends who, who I met came to the Himalaya as well. Uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they also lived there, they're a group of translators. So it's like sort of my sort of heart friends. Mm. And so it's nice to be there when I'm not in Nepal, this kind of place where I feel comfortable to be. Yeah. So as we sit here, uh, the name of this is Good Life Project. And one of the things we, you know, we're really just exploring, what does it mean to live a good life? So if I offer that that question or that prompt out to you, what comes out? So I think a good life is uh, not only, of course, a life where you flourish. I mean, a really a life where every moment is filled worth living. And then when you look at 10 years, 20 years, you say, well, that was worth to be alive. So that sense of feeling fortunate, deep satisfaction. And for that, I can't b believe that it can happen if you uh, try to pursue a, a happiness in a selfish way. I think it's a self-destructing concept. It would never work because me, me, me all day long makes you miserable. It makes miserable everyone around. So I think genuine fulfillment and flourishing can only come through, you know, a, a big heart, uh, unconditional benevolence, and that fulfills the aspiration of others, of course, because it is the point, but also that's the best way to fulfill your own aspiration for happiness. So there's a win-win situation. Selfishness is a lose-lose situation. So that, and that's really, I'm totally convinced of that. That's also why before this, Beyond the Self, I wrote a, much too big book on altruism, 800 pages, because I wanted to make a case that this is the most pragmatic answer to the challenges of our times. You know, for the care for future generation, for the environment, care for social justice in the midterm, and more caring economics in the short term. Altruism is the answer, not selfishness. So mm. that's, I think, a great source of joy to have shared some ideas. And now, as I'm getting older, I want to gain some freedom to continue my path mm. thank you most welcome hey thanks so much for listening and thanks also to our fantastic sponsors who help make this show possible you can check them out in the links we've included in today's show notes and while you're at it be sure to click on the subscribe button in your listening app so you never miss an episode and then share the good life project love with friends because when ideas become conversations that lead to action, that's when real change takes hold. See you next time.